Oh, I think we're recording. All right. Do you see your friends? There they are. All right, it's enough. They're very excited to be here. They told me before I turned this on that that they've been looking forward to this class all morning. Over here is, well, I can go all the way over to here to be on the screen. Okay. Torque. Here's a very quick review of what we have learned in the last two days. Very quick. So it won't be everything. Torque is symbolized by the Greek letter tall. And it means a force that tends to make something rotate. If, if this is a meter stick and there's a pivot point here where the dot is, it can rotate this way if you apply a force here. It could also rotate that way if you apply a force here. If those forces are equal, Steve, which one of these forces, they're both force F, same number of newtons, which one would create more torque? This one, correct. Because it's farther from the pivot point. So what the one thing that we learned in the last two days, as far as the math goes, is that torque is equal to RF where R is the distance from the force to the pivot point, F is the actual number of newtons of force. Uh, and so torque is directly proportional to both of those things. Now, the other thing we talked about that, that uh, was in the last two days was that sometimes there's more than one torque. And we talked about things like this wheel, where there's a force there that's tangent to the, to the outer part of the wheel. That's a force. And here's another force that's equal, and they're both down. What's the net torque on the wheel? What's the net torque, Jaden? Zero. Zero. If the forces are equal, because that's F and that's R, well, that's F, which is the same, and that's R, which is the same. So uh, they cancel each other out, because this one is tending to cause it to rotate in a counterclockwise direction, that's positive torque. This one's tending to make it rotate in a clockwise direction, that's negative torque. And so the positive torque plus the negative torque add up to zero. The net torque is zero. Okay, that's all we learned the last two days, really. Do you agree with that, Cole? That all we really learned? We looked at some other examples, but that's it. Now here's what we're doing today. Conditions for equilibrium. The term equilibrium means uh, uh, the object's not accelerating. It's in equilibrium. And we've used that term before. We have said before, the first law of motion it occurs when the sum of the forces is zero. And so even if there are forces acting on something, they all add up to zero, so they cancel each other out. That object is in equilibrium. We've already said that. So today I'm going to tell you there are three, really four, but I'm going to say three conditions for equilibrium. There are three conditions. Number one is when the sum of the X forces adds up to zero. <laughs> and number two, is when the sum of all the y forces add up to zero. So those are the ones we talked about last semester. You already know that. Now, there is a third one. It's when the sum of the z forces add up to zero. You know, there is a third dimension of space. But, but we do everything on the board where there are two dimensions, so don't worry about that right now. So x and y. We've done a lot of things with x and y. If, if those all add up to zero, these all add up to zero, the object's in equilibrium. That's what you've learned from last semester. But today we're adding a, we're adding a third, not, and it's not Z. That would just be another dimension, same thing. But the third one is, the third condition for equilibrium is when the sum of all the torques is zero. Now that's different. These are both linear, x-axis, y-axis, and those directions. This is torque, which you now know is 
r times f. When those add up to zero, like they did on the wheel just a moment ago, where that one and that one are equal, that wheel is in equilibrium. Now, if they don't add up to zero, if you only have one force there, it's going to be rotating, isn't it? That's going to rotate in that direction because of this one force. So that's not equilibrium. Now, the wheel's not moving up and down or left and right. See, that's this. For that wheel right now, if that's the only force acting on it, it's going to rotate, but still these first two would be true. Some of the X forces is zero. That means the whole wheel doesn't move to the right or to the left. The sum of the Y forces is zero. That means the wheel itself doesn't move up or down on the board, but it, the wheel would be rotating. So number three is not true. Therefore, the wheel's not in equilibrium. By the way, the word four has an R in it. <clears throat> you worried about that, Kyle? No, I was fine. You hadn't noticed the R missing? Okay. All right. If, the, if all three conditions are true, so I go back to my wheel now and I, here's a force. Okay. And if that's true, now all three conditions are true. That wheel is in equilibrium. It's not moving left or right. It's not moving up or down, and it's not rotating. All right, what we're gonna do is the rest of this period is talk about this third one. Look at some examples of how we can use that, because we've used these before. But today, how can we use that to solve some problems? All right, this is gonna be great. This is good. We're going to start out by taking one of you and placing you on a great big board that, had, that is resting on uh, a stack of books here and a stack of books here. Okay, and there's the floor. And there's the board, and you you, Min Ho, are standing right here. This person right here is Min Ho. And see Min Ho, he's got, he's got the dark hair, and he's, he's smiling, and he's standing on the board. All right. Do you think these books are applying a force to the board? This is an easy question, not a trick question. Are the, are the books applying a force to the board right yes. here? Yes. Because the board's, the board's being pulled down, and so the books are pushing back up. The board's not moving. The board's not moving, is it? Okay. So, the books are applying a force to the board. We would even call that a normal force because it's pushing up perpendicular to its surface. See? So there's a normal force of the books pushing up right there. What about the books over here? Are they pushing up? Yes, there's a normal force of the books pushing up there as well. Now, my first question is, are these two normal forces the same? What do you think? No, no. no you are correct. Now we're assuming the board is is a, is the same throughout. The, the board is consistent. It's it's you know the same thickness here as it is there. Okay, the board's the same, but the person Minho is not standing in the middle, is he? No. He's standing over here. So which one of these normal forces is greater? Do you think? The right one. The one on the right. Yeah. So we're going to draw that one a little longer. Now. What if the question is, how much force is this normal force? Normal force two and normal force one. We'll label them so we because they're not the same. What if the question is, uh, what is normal force two? All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to draw a free body diagram on the board first. All the forces acting on the board, and we've already got two of them. There's a normal force one, the book's pushing up. Normal force two, those books pushing up. And that's greater. What other forces are acting on the board? All right, what's another one? 
gravity. There's the force of gravity on the board, which is the weight of the board. Now, when you draw the weight of something, when you draw a vector for the weight of something, you put it in its center of mass. So if the board really is evenly distributed, the wood in the board is evenly distributed, the center of mass would be in the very middle. So we draw from the very middle, we draw a vector, and that's mg for the board. That's the weight of the board. Now, what else? There's one more force, which is what? The weight of Minho. Yeah, the weight of Minho. Because his feet are pushing down on the board, aren't they? Okay, so the weight of Minho, which is probably a lot more than the weight of the board. So this is the board B, and this is M, that's Minho. Okay, are there any other forces acting on this board? No. There are other forces acting on, you know, the board's pushing up on Minho, but we're just talking about all the forces on the board. That's it. Gravity's pulling the board down. Minho is pushing the board down. But the books are pushing up. And the board's not moving, so you know that the sum of all the forces somehow add up to zero because the board is not accelerating in any direction. All right. I want to know what's Fn2. And, of course, I, I can't really come up with a number unless I know the weights. So let me, let's make up the weight. Let's say the weight of the board, let's say the weight of the board is, is 100 newtons. And let's say Minho's weight is, is 400 newtons. I'm just making up numbers here. So we know this number and we know that number, but we don't know this one and we don't know that one. What do you think is one more thing we probably ought to know if we're actually going to calculate this? And and we we don't have a way to measure either one of these. You can't just measure them. We're going to have to calculate them. So there's one more thing we need to know what is it, that we could measure. The long the board is. How long the board is would be really good to know. The length of the board, we're going to say, is two meters long, the whole board. And the last thing would be to measure where, what? He is on the board. Where Minho is. How far is he from something? All right, let's say the whole thing's two meters. So let's say Minho is 0.5 meters we're just making this up again, from one end of the board. He's 0.5 meters away, so he's one and a half meters from that one, because remember, the whole thing's two. All right. Now, if we know all that, we can calculate it, and here's how. We start by, now, here, let's start the way that you would have started last semester first. You would have said, oh, the sum of all the y forces equals zero. Because every force up here is a y force. They're all vertical, aren't they? Mm -hmm. But if you do that, you can't come up with this because you don't know that. You've got two unknowns. Without me writing it out, do you see that? Now, it's true. The two ups have to equal the two downs. And we know the two downs. We know this and this. They add up to 500 newtons. So the two ups have to add up to 500 newtons, but they're not equal. Therefore, we don't know what, what this one is. We don't know how much more it is, do we? But keep in mind that we know that. We know that this has to be true, but we can't solve it that way. The way we're going to solve it is by saying the sum of all the torques equals zero. Torques, the board's not rotating. It doesn't have to rotate. There are still torques that are acting on the board. Here's what you do when you say the sum of the torques equals zero. You establish a pivot point. The torque is RF, and R is the distance from F to the pivot point. So where's the pivot point? And the great thing about torque problems is you can make the pivot point anywhere you want. You pick a point where it'll be easy, though. So what I'm going to do for this first problem is pick this as the pivot point. Here is the pivot point where that big dot is. It's, in other words, it's the far left end of the board. That's the pivot point. It's right where the books are. The book should be at the very end of the board, too. Okay. 
like they are here. Okay, so the pivot point is where this Fn1 is. Now, it's not really going to pivot there. Nobody's going to take the board and make it rotate like that. But in your mind, you set it up. Okay, there's a pivot point because now I can establish torques. Here's what I don't want, the sum of all the torques now acting on the board where that's the pivot point. So let's go through all the forces. Go through all four forces. What is the torque due to Fn1? If that's the pivot point, what's the torque right there? Zero. zero. Because R is zero, isn't it? So that's not, there is no torque there. Just leave that out. That's the reason this, this equation works. One of our unknowns, we're going to leave out because the torque is zero. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, what's the torque here? Uh, Mg there is 100. That's the force. What is R? R is the distance from the force to the pivot point. That's one meter, isn't it? Okay, so our first torque is 100 times one. Now, is it positive or negative? You have to think about that. Negative. It's tending, it, imagine this really is a, as a pivot point. If it did pivot on around that point, this force would be making it rotate clockwise, wouldn't it? That's negative. All right, so make it negative. All right, the next force is this one, which is Minho's weight, 400. And how, what is R now? 1.5. It's the distance from his weight to the pivot point, which is 1.5. 1.5. Now, is that positive or negative? Negative. That's negative also. So there you go. See what we've done? We've got a negative torque there and another negative torque here. And then finally, the Fn2. That's what I don't know. That's my unknown. But that torque is going to be positive, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it, it that would tend to make it rotate in the counterclockwise direction. So positive, am I still on the... There you go. Positive Fn2, that's this force, times what R? Two. The distance from this to that is two meters. So Fn times two. All of that has to add up to zero. zero. Now you have an equation with only one unknown. You can solve, can't you? Mm -hmm. What does that come out to be? 350. Yeah. Three, what is it? 350, yeah. Okay, Fn2 is equal to 350 newtons. You couldn't solve that with the y forces because you had two unknown y forces, but when you use torques, one of them goes away because it is at the pivot point. Now, what if then the next question, that was part A. What is Fn2? Part B would be what is Fn1? What if you ask that question? Could you answer it pretty quickly without doing a whole lot of thinking? Yes. Anybody know the answer? Now you can go back and do this again. Moving the pivot point to over here. Because the, the pivot point's arbitrary. You decide where it goes. Move the pivot point back over here. And now that would be your unknown, wouldn't it? You could do it that way. But easier now would be to say, well, the sum of all the y forces is zero. Go back to what you learned last semester, not torque. There is no pivot point when you use y forces. That means the two ups have to equal the two downs, but we now know this is 350, don't we? Mm -hmm. What does that have to be? 150. Has to be 150. Uh, if, I, if I put in all the y torques, there's Fn1 uh, plus Fn2, which is 350. And then minus the, the 100 for the board and minus the 400 for Minho, that equals zero. See, here are the two ups. Here are the two downs. Now the sign is up is positive, down is negative, so don't get mixed up. Up here, the signs were, is it clockwise or counterclockwise? That's torque. Down here, we went back to what you learned last semester, y forces. Up is positive, down is negative. Okay. And when you solve that for Fn1, uh, you get, yes, you get 150 newtons. So in this case, 
because Minho is standing over here closer to this set of books, it should make sense that more force is this side of the board's having to push up harder than that side is. All right. See how we solved the problem where nothing was really rotating in that problem, but we solved it using torques. All right. Any questions about that? We're going to look at another example of how we can use the sum of the torques equals zero to solve a problem. This one's going to be harder. What time do we get out of here today, Jaden? Regular schedule Wednesday. 9.45. 9.45. We have 15 minutes. Which one can we do in 15 minutes? Let's do... Let's do a ladder, a ladder <coughs> problem. Ladders, these can be hard. You know what, let's do easy ones first. Let's do easy ones first. We'll save the ladder for tomorrow. We'll save the ladder for tomorrow, it's kind of hard. Here, let's do an easy one. We kind of looked at a thing like this yesterday, but it's a good example, the seesaw. It's a good example of this. The sum of the torques is zero. Um, if I put, if I put um, a person here who, and we, we did this yesterday, this person weighs 500 newtons, and this person over here who's walking up only weighs 400 newtons, this person's at the end of the seesaw. Where does that one have to sit? No, nope, that's not going to work, is it? This person's even bigger. See, this person is is eight hundred. No, yeah, it's okay. Eight hundred newtons. <laughs> this one's five hundred newtons, and this one does have some legs. Where does that one have to sit to balance the seesaw? If the seesaw is balanced, this will be true. All right, draw the free body diagram first. All the forces acting on the seesaw. All right, well, here's this one already drawn, 500 newtons. Over here is going to be this one once the person gets on. We don't know where, but let's just draw it somewhere. Just pick a spot so we can draw it, but it's going to be longer at 800 newtons. Now the weight of the board is also there, but the weight of the board would be drawn right here in the middle. Whatever the board weighs, whatever this, this bar or board weighs would be right here in the middle. Um, but we're also gonna put our pivot point there. So that won't create any torque, will it? If that's the pivot point, then in the weight of the board, mg is the weight of the board, that's right at the pivot point, then that produces zero torque. So it's not going to be in our equation down here. Whatever force is at the pivot point doesn't show up there, does it? So we can then treat this kind of the same way we did the last problem. The sum of the torques will be zero. Here's the first one. The force is 500. What's the distance to the pivot point? What do you want to call it? I didn't give you a number, so what do you want to call it? A meter. Just make up a number? A meter. Why don't we call it R? Because we don't know it's a meter. You do that. <laughs> We're going to let this distance from here to here be R. So 500 times R. Is that positive or negative torque? Positive. positive. It's tending to make it rotate. Just look at it. If that's the pivot point. Tending to make it rotate in the counterclockwise direction, so that's positive. This one is going to be tending from the pivot point to make it rotate in the clockwise direction, so it's negative, and it's 800 times some distance we don't know. That's R, so what is this? We don't know. We'll call it X. This distance from here to here is less than R. All the way to the end would be R, so it's some fraction of R isn't it? Uh, we, could, we could do that. Where x is the fraction of r. Does that make sense? 
We know, it's, we know that this distance is less than r, so it's going to be point something times r. Okay, now that has to add up to zero. Can you solve that for x? Can you solve that for x? The r's are going to cancel out if you just do the math that way. The r's will cancel out and you get negative 300 is that true? Negative 300x equals, well, that didn't work out at all. No, you don't get negative 300x. This is 500r. This is, here, take one over to the other side. 500r equals 800xr. R's go away. 500 is equal to 800x. There you go. So it's simply 500 divided by 800 which is point, whatever five eighths is, point six two five, point six two five. X is point six two five. And so what you know is this person has to sit down over here at about two thirds approximately of the way out. Not all the way out, about, about six tenths of the way out could balance it. You see how, what we did? that makes sense? Some of the torques would be zero if the person sits there. Okay, that's the seesaw problem. Now, we're doing the easy ones to saving the latter for last. Here is a diving board. What? We got 950? Is it really 950? Who said, oh, it was you that said 945, wasn't it? Okay. Well, maybe we should do the ladder problem. It sounds fun. Yeah, let's do the ladder. We'll do the ladder. <clears throat> the ladder. You all are up for a challenge, aren't you? Have I scared you sufficiently about the ladder that you are worried about it? Here's a tall building. Here's a ladder that you a person could climb up to a window that's right there. And maybe the building's on fire and we need to we need to rescue someone. Okay. Anyway. The ladder. If you're climbing up a ladder, you don't want it to rotate, do you? That, that's bad. You want it to be in equilibrium, which means the sum of all the torques would be zero. You really want that to be true. If it starts to rotate, you know, if it starts to do this. Bam, you fell off. Okay. Let's draw all the forces acting on the ladder. Let's, you could put a person on there, which would add another force, but let's just forget that for the moment. All the forces acting on the ladder right now, it's not moving. What are they? Mm -hmm. One would be mg, which again, if we assume the ladder's the weight is evenly distributed, it would be in the very center. So you go to the very middle, wherever that is, maybe it's about right there. But weight is always straight down, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's mg, the weight of the ladder. What's another force? Normal force. Normal force of the ground pushing straight up. Normal means perpendicular, so you know the normal force is perpendicular to the ground. It's in that direction. And I'll put g for the ground. The ground is pushing up on the base of the ladder. Okay, and there's at least one more force, which would have to be what? Force of the building. The, the wall, yeah, this building is, is also pushing perpendicular to itself. Now it can only push, a surface can only push perpendicular to itself. So, so that's a normal force also, but we'll put W for wall. So we don't get the, these two are not the same. That's the ground pushing up. This is the wall pushing out. If the wall wasn't pushing out, the, the, the thing would, would be moving that way because gravity's there, see? The wall is what's stopping it from, from rotating that way. Now, there probably also is some friction up there, but let's ignore that for the moment. Pretend this is a really, really slippery wall. <laughs> and you don't need friction anyway to make it work, but let's just pretend, let's ignore friction. However, you can't ignore friction where? There has to be friction one other place, which is where? On the ground. 
on the ground. Here, here's some things you know before I draw the friction. Look at, look at what's up there right now. There's an up force and a down force. Here's a force to the left. If we stop right there, what would be wrong with that? There's not a force to the right. There has, there has to be a force to the right to cancel that out because the ladder is not moving to the left, is it? And both of these are vertical. They have no component that's to the left. If you've got a force to the left, you have to have a force to the right to balance it out so that the, the forces all add up to zero. Well, that force to the right is this. And that's friction between the base of the ladder and the ground. If there was no friction, even though there's a normal force pushing up, if it was really frictionless, this, this base would be sliding, wouldn't it? It would slide out and that would slide down. The whole thing would just do that. So there has to be some friction there between the base of the ladder and the ground. If not, it would, because of the weight right here pushing down, the whole thing would just start sliding like that. All right. Now, again, there could still be, there would be, if it started to slide, there would be some friction there. But let's ignore that. It's not really necessary for this problem. This is a workable situation where the ladder is not moving, so you know the, the sum of the x forces is zero. That's the left and right. They have to be equal. You know the sum of the y forces is zero. That's the up and the down. See those? They have to be equal. But you also know the sum of the torques is zero because it's not rotating. So whatever is producing positive torque, there has to be also negative torque to cancel it out. All three of these is true. All right. Let's say the question is, let's make a, a question like, um, what is mu? Is that too complicated for our first problem? Oh, well, is it, well, we'll make it simpler. What is the force of friction? Let's say that right there is what we don't know. We'd like to know. That's the one I know. And you know the weight of the ladder. We have yet to know something. Let's say the ladder is, is 200 newtons, the weight of the ladder. So we know one thing, mg for the ladder, 200. We don't know anything else. Here's what we do. You can't find friction using the sum of the x forces because even though we know, now look at what we know. We know it has to be equal to this, don't we? The left and right have to be equal. We don't know what that is. So that doesn't help us. All right, here's what we do then. The sum of the torques is zero. Let's just start with that. When you start with the sum of the torques is zero, the first thing you do is draw a free body diagram. We did that. Next thing you do is you pick a pivot point. Now pick a pivot point somewhere where there are things you don't know because that force goes away. Remember what happens here? When the force is at the pivot point, it's not in the equation. Hmm. Now that makes me want to pick it up here because I don't know what that is. But the truth is I also don't know what either one of these is. I still have two unknowns. So what I'm going to do is pick my pivot point to be down here. Now you might be saying, oh, well, that'll make friction go away, and it will. However, the reason I picked it for down here is that eliminates both of these, and I'm only going to have two torques in my equation, aren't I? And if I could find that one, would that help me? Because we've already said that's equal to friction. friction. See what, how we thought that through? Okay. So I'm going to put the pivot point down here. That means you imagine the ladder could pivot right there on the ground. It's not going to, but imagine that that's the pivot point. All right, that's the pivot point. I've got two different forces that are not there. Those both go away. But I've got this one and this one that, that are still there. One of them is mg. And... I need to know what mg is. Well, I do know it's 200. But I also need to know r. r is half the length of the ladder. I'm going to use l for the length, the total length of the ladder. What is the length of the ladder? I don't know. But, but that's in the middle. 
the, the weight vector is in the very center. So one half L is the R. But what's wrong so far? But I mean, what have I not done that, that I can't stop here? It has to be negative. The, yeah, well, you have to say it's negative. It's going to tend to rotate it clockwise. All right, put a negative there, but there's one more thing. You need a Y component. Yeah, these are not perpendicular. They're not perpendicular, are they? There's the force. There's R. They're not perpendicular. And what we learned about this equation is that RF, R and F have to be perpendicular. So I need components. And I'm going to get components, I think, for, um, for the ladder. Now, that means you need to do that, you need to know this angle. You need to know theta. And so let's say theta is, what do you think it is? Maybe 60 degrees, maybe 50. What do you think it is? 60. Let's make it kind of easy. Let's say theta is 60 degrees from, that's the angle between the ladder and the ground. Now, if I do that, I have components, I can try to use blue here, for R. Now, this is technically, this is R, the distance from the force to the pivot point, but that's the hypotenuse of my triangle. These blue lines are going to be the, the component triangle where, um, if F is straight down, do I want this component of R or that component of R? The one that pertains to. I want the one that's perpendicular to F. F and R have to be perpendicular, and F is straight down. So this blue line I drew right here is now the component of R that is perpendicular to F. And that's adjacent to my angle 60. So I'm going to let this be R times the cosine of 60. Does that make sense? Maybe I lose you there. So cosine 60. So this torque from the force is mg, that's the weight, which we know is 200, times 1 half L, whatever L is. So that's, that's the distance R, 1 half L. But the cosine 60 is there to give us a component that's perpendicular to the force. Now you can get components of the force if you want to let this, if that is easier for you to, to say um, that's R, and then if, if that's F, I need a component, components like this for F, so that you like that better? Or that's a component that's adjacent, or I'm sorry, it, it is adjacent, but it's perpendicular to R, and it's adjacent to my 60 degree angle, so I'm still gonna use cosine 60. I like it better this way, it just looks better. So it's, it's my, my triangle is similar to the whole triangle I've drawn. Okay, either way you get cosine of 60 for that torque. All right, the other force is this one, which is tending to make it rotate counterclockwise, so that's positive. And it's the normal force of the wall. And um, its R is the entire length, isn't it, of the ladder. So it's, it's, that's R. However, that's not perpendicular either, is it? So I need, again, I need to get components of something of, of R that would be perpendicular and now since R is the entire length of the ladder, that entire length is the hypotenuse. F is straight out to the left, so I need something perpendicular to that, and that would be this thing right here. This one over here is parallel with F. This one here is perpendicular to F, and that's my 60 degree angle there. So this is opposite the 60 degree angle, so this time I'm going to say sine of 60. Equals zero. Some of the torques, these are only two torques because we eliminated those two. The torque due to the weight is this, and we know that's 200. The torque due to the normal force is this, and that's our unknown right there.
the L's will cancel out and you can then solve it for this. Because we know that's 200. You have negative 200 times one half. The L's are going to cancel times the cosine of 60 and plus the normal force of the wall times the sine of 60. And you can all solve that for this now. See what we did? And when you get this, then you have to, you, you know, whatever that is, that's going to be some number of newtons. You have to recognize, well, that is equal to friction, which was the question. So then you go back and say, okay, friction is also equal to that same thing because the sum of the x forces is zero. The, the two x forces have to equal each other. So that's how, once you solve it for this, well, that's the same answer here. And that's the question we started out with. How much friction is there between the ladder and the ground? All right. Now, that's, there's a lot of physics there. That's a lot of thinking. So we're going to practice this more. But who has a question about what we just did right there? You okay with that? All right. The bell's going to ring in about five seconds. I'm going to turn off the camera and your homework.